large screen. Here we go. I am so happy to be back in Tokyo. This is one of my favorite cities in the whole world. I've had the good fortune to be here. I think this is my fourth time to visit, and um, I always love it here. So, as she said, my name is Mark Collier, and I'm the COO with the OpenStack Foundation. And if you are on Twitter, you're welcome to follow me. My name on Twitter is Sparky Collier. So, with that, I'm going to kick it off. I'm going to just tell you a little bit about what OpenStack is. I'm guessing most of you already know what OpenStack is, but it always um, is good to start with a little baseline knowledge so we're all on the same page. So, as I'm sure you've probably figured out by now, uh, OpenStack is software, meaning code, but it's also a community, and I'm happy to inform you that you are all part of that OpenStack community. So if you want to know what the OpenStack community looks like, look around. You, you are it. And I want to share some stories today about the OpenStack community, some information, some data, about just how big and uh, active and global the OpenStack community is. But first, just a quick overview of the platform itself. So, of course, uh, OpenStack is software for building public and private clouds, and that's exactly what many, many people are doing with it all over the world today. And I have a few examples that I'll go through of some of the, the big users that are building public and private clouds. But at a high level, what the software is designed to do is to let you um, control pools of resources in a data center. So storage, compute, networking, the basic building blocks of any data center allows you to automate that um, it puts an API on top so that your infrastructure is now uh, controllable through an API and your applications can actually talk to that API, which is the OpenStack API. Um, and then there's also a dashboard which allows self-service provisioning, control, both administrator views as well as end users. So if you've ever used a public cloud, you understand kind of how the web, the web interfaces work and so we have that capability as well. And the software itself is, of course, open source and available under the Apache 2.0 license, which was a decision that I think was very important to the early success of OpenStack, uh, given that the Apache license is very uh, permissible, very business friendly, and uh, allows uh, people to take that and do a lot of things with it to meet their needs. Uh, when you look at the different individual components, compute, storage, uh, both object storage and block storage, networking and the dashboard, as I mentioned, these are all the fundamental building blocks of any infrastructure as a service. Whether you're a service provider or if you, in many cases in the enterprise, we see companies that are essentially like service providers to their employees and they're providing very similar capability. And then we have shared services like the multi-tenant authentication system, as well as the image service for um, moving your virtual machine images um, into production and saving the, the ones that uh, are your template for your application. Um, let's see here. This is not coming forward. There we go. Uh, OpenStack is developed through a very unique um, software development process. I think it's very important to understand how it works whether you want to build a business around OpenStack or you want to run it, um, whatever your interest is, um, understanding how the software gets made is very important um, because everyone has a role in it, and that's unique versus a traditional um, proprietary software model where users are lucky if they get uh, once a year an opportunity to tell their sales rep uh, what they'd like to see on the roadmap. Um, users are much more in control, much more in the driver's seat, and they're much happier as a result. So we, we have a time-based release cycle. So twice a year we release a new version. We've never missed a deadline. Um, the next version is called Grizzly and it will be out next month. So we're excited to see that rapid pace of innovation. And by having a fixed release schedule, um, it allows other companies um, and users to uh, be able to plan their product plans or their uh, implementation plans around a predictable schedule and they know kind of when 
new releases are coming. Um, a very critical part of how we decide what goes into the software are design summits. Now, have anyone here ever attended an OpenStack design summit? Let's see, any hands? A few? Well, I would very much encourage you to attend if you, if you have the opportunity. Um, the next one is actually next month in Portland, and then in October uh, we'll be doing it again, and we're looking at, at various international venues uh, for that. So we'll, we'll have more news on that soon. But this is actually the event, the summit, where the developers and the users come together and decide what's going to be in the next release. So about two weeks after uh, Grizzly comes out, we'll be getting together in Portland and talking about what goes in Havana, which is the release after Grizzly. We've had extremely broad contributions to OpenStack from over 800 developers, and those developers work for over 50 companies all over the globe. And this is very important to understand. This is a critical piece of why we believe OpenStack is going to be the platform uh, for the cloud in the long run is because of this diversity and the size of the developer community. There's very few other open source projects that, that have this kind of um, this kind of diversity of contribution and size of contribution. And in the closed source world, of course, uh, everyone works for one company. So we think that this is really the secret sauce for OpenStack. And all of the, ele of the leadership in the technical world are elected by the contributors to the project. So the people that work on it um, have, have the ability to, to self-govern, if you will, and that's worked very well for us. And many developers are attracted to this, to this model. Um, and it's a lot more fun. So if you're a developer, you should get involved. I think you'll like it. So, a little bit about the global community. Um, we have 172 companies now. This slide uh, goes out of date about once an hour because we have uh, new individual members joining every day. I would encourage all of you to join the foundation. It's free. And uh, you can make this number go up by 1,000 if, if, if everybody here everybody here joins. So those, those individual members come from over 100 countries. And, and to give you an idea of the, the amount of um, software development going on, we had over 3,000 patches submitted just in the fourth quarter. So if, when you think about trying to manage 800 developers across the world, we have a very sophisticated system for code review in which um, the leaders of, of the project are able to um, give feedback and accept patches as, as they come in when they, when they meet the quality standards. So, we, uh, when we launched the foundation, I'll tell you a little bit more about the foundation in a moment, but when we launched the foundation, we had parties all over the world. Um, we have over 40 user groups. Um, another thing if, that you might not know about OpenStack is that uh, we like to party. So if you like to party, you're, you're in the right community now. Um, and so these are just a few of those, a few of those uh, events. So you may know some of these people, but um, all over the world, we had a simultaneous celebration. People were very excited that we had a foundation um, started back in September. And I, I mentioned that the users are very much in control of their own destiny with OpenStack, and we, we value them highly. Um, when you come to our OpenStack summits, you'll, you'll see that uh, we, help, we ask big users to come in and tell their story, what problems they're solving, share with other users. Um, because those are really the people that we're, we're all working for, ultimately. So just to give you a few examples of companies that are using OpenStack and, and how, they're, how they're solving problems with it. Um, Mercado Libre is the eighth largest e-commerce site in the world. They are uh, sometimes referred to as the eBay of Latin America. They're in South America and they have a very large business um, and when you are an e-commerce site, uh, you cannot have downtime. Your infrastructure decisions are very carefully considered. And we are very lucky that they were committed to OpenStack early on. They've been running it for quite some time. They're running it in production. And, uh, and as they say here, we have uh, user stories on our website. And this is just a little excerpt. If you go to OpenStack.org, you can read more. But he said, our main goal was to achieve a new level of agility and flexibility and demonstrate we could remove the manual work associated with deploying new resources. We achieved this. 
So this is a very common theme. I think anyone embracing cloud and looking at OpenStack is, is agility, being able to move more quickly, and it really pays off for companies when they, when they commit to it. PayPal is the PayPal of, of the world. Um, so they, they are certainly large in, in the US, but they also have a pretty strong presence in other countries. And uh, just as, as an example of how much mobile, or how much payment processing they do, just in the mobile space, they were processing $26,000 per minute in 2012 in payments. So this is another commerce-related um, technology company that is not going to, to um, pick a platform like OpenStack or any other platform without doing their homework. And um, again, they mentioned they wanted uh, agility without sacrificing um, availability. And that's, that's a very common, common theme. Um, this is another company that's uh, using OpenStack that was just announced about a week ago, in fact. Um, this is a large um, company in Russia that has a lot of um, data centers that they manage and they're building both public and private clouds. And um, I found this quote to be really exciting personally. He said, we want our customers to have freedom of choice. We do believe that OpenStack is bringing that dimension. Russia has a long, long history of being um, dominated by one party. Freedom of choice is important from a historical perspective, a similar trend that you observe everywhere. So I hope that's true. I hope there is a trend everywhere towards freedom. Um, I like freedom. Does anybody here like freedom? Anybody else? Okay, good, in the right place. So I'll talk a little bit more about freedom, but open source is certainly um, compatible with that, ideal. CloudUp is the first cloud service provider in Italy, and they're using OpenStack. And they uh, said here in their case study that they see OpenStack as the Linux of the cloud. This is something we hear quite a bit. Uh, we are excited to hear it, although, of course, humbled, we know that uh, we have a long way to go before we've made the kind of impact that Linux has made, but um, it's great that people have that faith in the project. Um, they did do an extensive evaluation against all the other major cloud platforms, and um, we really like the modular nature of OpenStack. It's designed to be pluggable, so you can plug in your storage engine of choice, you can plug in your network engine of choice, you can plug in your billing system, you can plug in your monitoring system. So it doesn't uh, prescribe exactly you know, every aspect of, of your life. It gives you a lot, of, a lot of choice and flexibility and freedom on how you implement your cloud, and they found that to be a good reason to select it. Intel, probably all heard of Intel. Um, but did you know they have 69 data centers? I didn't know anyone in the world had 69 data centers, um, but apparently they do just for their own um, internal use. And that's a big job. So when you have an IT department that's, that's managing 69 data centers and 75,000 servers, they, they value automation that can save them huge amounts of money as well as reliability and what they said was that OpenStack dramatically reduced the amount of time it takes to provision services. Um, and they can now deploy VM in just five to 10 minutes, provide faster self-service. So I think self-service is an interesting trend. Uh, we know that, of course, users, in, especially inside of companies, are attracted to public clouds because they don't have to go through a lengthy IT requisition process. But a lot of IT organizations are starting to um, deploy self-service tools so they can empower their users as well. And that's a, something that, that makes everybody happy, both IT and employees. So I thought I would just uh, show you a little bit of data um, as we go through here about the different types of uh, users and the interest we see all over the world. Um, this data here actually shows you uh, the top 25 well, it's hard to see the, the map, but it's color-coded. But we have um, people from all over the world, over 100 countries, uh, visiting OpenStack.org, our website. So this is from Google Analytics. And you can see that, uh, that Japan is, is number seven. Love to see that um, even higher. But uh, obviously, there's uh, look around. It's no secret. There's a lot of interest in OpenStack. So we're very excited about that. 
And just for your information, I included the top 10 um, cities or regions within Japan um, in terms of where the interest is coming from measured by the visitors to our website. So the next thing I wanted to do was tell you a little story about what our community is capable of. When you have a community that's this large and diverse, we can do big things. And I think if there's one thing I want to leave you with today, it's that we should dream big, we should think big, and we should uh, try to do the impossible as a community because we have done it time and time again. And in this case, a, a group of people, very ambitious people in the OpenStack community from many different countries decided they were gonna to try to get together. They came to Austin, Texas, and they wanted to write an entire book in just five days. And this is a serious book. This is not you know, a, a white paper or a small, uh, a small pamphlet. This is a book that uh, is actually over 230 pages. And they actually came together and they did it. They completed the book in five days. It is the first OpenStack operations guide and this um, book was written by a bunch of people who have experience operating OpenStack clouds and I think one of the things we've learned is that um, there's a handful of people that have an incredible knowledge and expertise about how OpenStack works about how to operate it at scale and sharing that knowledge is every bit as important as sharing the code so everyone knows open source is about sharing code sharing software but sharing the knowledge is, is absolutely just as important. And that's what these people were, were willing to do. And I actually have a short video I was gonna play that talks a little bit about their experience. So let me see if I can, uh, if I can play this. large group to work on a book that the community has been asking for for a very long time, um, The Operator's Guide. So this week I um, brought in a facilitator that I worked with um, before um, to facilitate what we call a book sprint. So we're crazy, but we're writing a book in five days. Basically, OpenStack's really popular, so there's been something that's been happening quite frequently uh, of late, which is managers have been going to their system administrators pointing at them and saying, hey, in addition to the 30 million other things that you're already doing, now you're running an OpenStack cloud. And we're hoping that with this book, it's going to help them uh, hate their managers just that little bit less. It's going to provide a, a real foundation for people who are getting started with OpenStack to allow them to, to pick a point to get on board and then develop their knowledge from that point on. What we wanted was um, true operator stories um, true um, use cases that their employers are willing to share um, and try to get a lot more information from um, the community group. I've been trying to show people, other operators, how they can actually kind of customize certain aspects of OpenStack and how they can make it do uh, what they want it to do without actually necessarily changing the core OpenStack code. We've been saying that we're writing this book in five days, but the truth of the matter is, is that our facilitator is actually kind of whipping us uh, repeatedly to actually get it written in, in four days or, or even less, where we actually get pump all the content into the book, into this book type tool. And at that point, you know, once we've got all the raw content in there, we start reviewing and reviewing and reviewing. This was written in a really unique way, in a really open way, but also that we would love to support these continuing efforts and that the book is becoming this live thing that we want to update over time. So it's not that we all own the content or that a publisher gets to keep it, but that we are making this um, community-centric book that the OpenStack community can then own um, modify, update, and uh, really become a part of its building. You know, we've just dove right into it and it's been exhausting and stressful at times, but I think we're getting something, getting something kind of special done for the community here. So, uh, if you're planning to build an open sub cloud or you're operating it or planning to operate a cloud, you should definitely have a look. So it's pretty, pretty impressive what 
is possible when uh, a group of very passionate people come together and they, they believe in uh, they believe in their project. So I'm very very proud to work in a community that can that can pull that off. So uh, this actually this book was only written two weeks ago. So this is very uh, new information, and in less than a week. Um, it was actually it was actually published about a week ago, in fact. And two weeks ago, they were in Austin writing the book. So this book was put online about a week ago, and in less than a week, we had over 2,000 people download the book. That is phenomenal to me. That, that tells me that this group of passionate stackers was on onto something. They knew they had knowledge that other people needed, and they were willing to share it. And that is an amazing thing, and I, I'm very proud to be part of a community like that. So when you think about those 2,000 people that have downloaded the book in only a week, it's very interesting to see where those people are. So we took a look at some of the data, and in that one week's time, from the time that book was put online, and we didn't do a lot of promotion around it, I mean, we, we literally just put it on Twitter and, and put it on our blog, and that was it. And in a week, people from 80 different countries have downloaded this book. That is, that is phenomenal. I, I've never seen anything like this in my career, and it's the, one of the reasons why I think open source and a community-driven technology platform really matter, and I think they're gonna win. And here's another interesting cut of the data. Those 2,000 people, not only were they from 80 different countries, they were actually in 700 different cities. So. As much as I would love to go to all 700 of these cities and have a conversation like this, obviously that's not possible. Um, but you know, through the power of collaboration and the internet and uh, an open publishing system, we're able to reach people in 700 countries, excuse me, cities in uh, in a week with some very valuable information. I mean, this is not a marketing um, promotional slide. Um, that we're printing out. And this is not a white paper. This is a 230 page manual on how to operate OpenStack. So people are building clouds out there with OpenStack and they're looking for information on how to best operate it. And actually, uh, this is a, an interesting data point that, that Tokyo, or Monado to be more precise, is, is actually the number fourth largest, uh, most, most popular city. So some of you in here may have downloaded this book. But in fact, if everyone in here does download the book, Tokyo will, will certainly jump up to number one. So I invite you to download it. It's free. Um, you can purchase the printed copy. Um, if you want a, a bound printed copy, that's also available already, even within a few days of, of, of putting the book online because of some, some on-demand book publishing that's, that's, cap that's possible nowadays. But, um, but you can download the, the electronic copy for free. Oops. Oh boy. There we go. Um, so, if anybody uh, doesn't get this URL and wants to find me afterwards, I'm happy to 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 give it to you. But it's bitly slash openstackguide bit .ly. So, please download the book and let's let's make Tokyo number one. So, I want to tell you a little bit about who's behind OpenStack, kind of how we're organized and um, try not to bore you too much with those details because after that I want to talk about why um, we believe that people are interested in OpenStack and why we think it's, it matters. Um, so I think you're all aware that we have a foundation now. I'm the COO at the foundation. I was previously with Rackspace when we started OpenStack and we always believed that the, to make OpenStack successful it needed to be independent, it needed to have very broad industry support, and um, that happened much faster than we expected. So last year we set out to create a foundation and the foundation uh, launched in September. And the, the responsibility and the, the mission is protecting, empowering, and promoting OpenStack software and the community around it, including users, developers, and the entire ecosystem. And it's important to understand that we talk a lot about community, we use that word a lot, but we, we really define it very broadly um, every single person in here is part of this community. Every single person that's interested in OpenStack that wants to learn more or contribute in some way is part of the community, whether they're a user or a developer or some 
in some part of the ecosystem. You know, we have over 8,000 individual members today, uh, up from about 5,000 when we launched in September, so it's already grown quite, quite quickly. Um, we have the leaders in global IT as gold and platinum members that, that have helped us get off to a very strong start. Um, the board of directors, like most organizations, sets the strategic direction at a high level. Uh, we have project technical leads, which, um, which are elected, um, as well as a technical committee. And they really make day-to-day -day decisions about the software. And um, a new group that we formed with the foundation was a user committee led by Tim Bell from CERN. If you're not familiar with CERN, they're trying to determine the uh, meaning of the universe, uh, something uh, very audacious like that. Um, he has a funny line that, uh, that apparently um, scientists, physicists have not figured out where 96% of all matter is, so they're looking for it and they're hoping OpenStack can lead them to it. So, uh, the approach we took with the foundation was a permanent legal home, it's a nonprofit with broad support and the resources to support the success. Um, but when we set it up, we weren't trying to fix something that was broken. We felt that OpenStack had gotten off to a very strong start. We weren't really trying to change fundamentally how we got there. We just wanted to preserve what we call the OpenStack way, which includes the technical uh, community making technical decisions. And uh, it sounds kind of obvious, but uh, it's not always how it works in every some software uh, organizations. And uh, you know, having significant resources we can use to to throw events, to manage the community and do community development. And we do believe in a strong ecosystem of companies making money. Many of you here perhaps work for companies that are interested in making money on OpenStack. We do not think that is a bad thing. We think that is a good thing. So we are, uh, we are certainly not um, against anyone making money. We think that if you think about those 800 developers who are writing the code that work for 50 companies, the vast majority of those companies are in some way part of the ecosystem. So we love creating jobs and we love creating developer jobs that developers love. And mo many developers love working on an open source. So we think that's, a, that's a, not a conflict at all. It's actually a, an important part of, of how we make OpenStack successful. And this is really just a graphical depiction of some of the different groups and how we're organized. Um, it is already out of date because the numbers um, grew so much after we launched in terms of the number of users and so forth, but the structures are all the same. So I uh, won't bore you anymore with governance, but suffice it to say the, the foundation, we believe, is an important part of keeping OpenStack free and independent from any one company. Um, and so this was a little bit of the the coverage when we launched in, in September, we saw um, people were excited about IBM and Red Hat, um, who, who not only were joining OpenStack, but they were founding platinum members of the foundation. They were really putting their money where their mouth was. They were helping us craft the bylaws. And both of those companies have a lot of history in open source. And uh, so we were able to benefit not just from their money, but also from their expertise in how to organize a foundation. And then my favorite headline is OpenStack Foundation Launches Giving Voice to Users. So this is a theme I'll keep repeating, but uh, it's very important we listen to our users. I hope there are some OpenStack users here today that I can meet uh, a little bit later on. These are the actual uh, gold and platinum founding member companies. So you probably recognize some of these names. Uh, there are also some startups that you may not know of. Uh, we think it's fantastic when you see the number of startups that are betting on OpenStack. Um, and a good example actually is Mitakura, who's um, based here in Japan, and um, hopefully is, is out there in the audience somewhere. Um, big fans of the work they're doing in networking. And then shortly after we announced the foundation and launched it, we actually had some uh, additional companies approach us uh, very quickly. We were surprised how excited they were about becoming gold members of the foundation, providing resources. And in particular, of course, I'd like to recognize NEC, uh, who has really made a big commitment to OpenStack. Um, they, are, they have core contributors that are contributing to the OpenStack networking, 
which is the codename Quantum Project you may have heard of. Um, that is one of the most exciting areas of innovation in, in cloud computing and in OpenStack. And so we're excited about all these companies um, joining so quickly, in, in particular NEC here in Japan, um, providing a lot of leadership and contribution to OpenStack. Um, and then in addition to the gold and platinum members, we have a number of sponsors. Um, the difference is the sponsors are not really uh, actively involved in the governance, the board of directors, they're, they're really just, you know, the companies that they want to provide us some, some help because they believe in the mission. And, um, and then we have a number of other supporting organizations um, who, who are in one way or another uh, betting on OpenStack. So before I talk about why there's so much interest in OpenStack and why we think it matters, I want to talk a little bit about how much interest there is um, not to brag, but just to share some data about how quickly this community is growing. Um, all of you here are a testament to, to that growth and, and interest and excitement. So this is our summit. I mentioned that twice a year we get together um, as a community and plan the next release of software. So those summits are very important part of, of our um, community building. And in the first summit we had 75 people. And in the last summit in October in San Diego, we had 1,400. So it's phenomenal growth. We've actually believed that we may have as many as 2,000 people at the next summit next month in Portland, Oregon. And again, I would encourage everyone to attend if you can. It's a very, uh, very good way to get involved and help um, shape the future direction of OpenStack. And if you, you know, wonder you know, who's leading OpenStack or who makes the decisions, the answer is, is all of you can make the decisions about where OpenStack's going. All you gotta do is, is come and participate. And this is the, the URL, openstack.org slash summit. Um, that always redirects to whatever is the upcoming summit. So we have a, a standard website for that. So, uh, openstack.org, the website where we have all the information about OpenStack, um, it gets over a million visitors a year unique visitors, and um, I think for a little uh, open source cloud computing project written in Python that got started by a few people um, hacking over a weekend in, at NASA, um, this is pretty amazing that a million people are interested in it, interested enough to find our website and, and visit. And of course the trend would suggest that you know it's gonna be more than a million this year. Um, another interesting way to take a look at the interest level for OpenStack is Google Trends, which basically me measures how often people are searching for something on Google, which is a good way to indicate they're interested in it. And you can see here that um, you know, OpenStack has continued to, be, uh, continue to grow and be quite popular with the Google. And um, we threw in another open source project there just for comparison, so you have a little bit of a of a guide for what we consider a, a success in uh, the interest level. Um, we only started our YouTube channel about six months ago, five months ago, when we launched the foundation. We did not have one before that. And we've already seen 37,000 views. So this is, again, people hungry for knowledge about OpenStack. Most of that content came from our last summit. So if you find our channel on there, um, you can go back and we have uh, 85 different sessions from the October summit, all high definition on YouTube. So even if you can't make it to the summits, we like to get the content and put it online and people can, can catch up. I also love this stat, 328,590 minutes watched. So people are putting their time into OpenStack um, and learning about it. That's a lot of time. Um, this next couple of slides just show a little bit about the media interest. I think we have some members of the media here today, hopefully are interested um, in, in taking notes. Love to talk more um, later with, with any of you who are here from the press. But there was an uh, analysis done for 2012 about how many articles were written about various um, cloud computing platforms. And um, you know we like graphs where OpenStack is the longest bar, so I guess 
you can't blame me for putting that up. Um, this is this one I think is is another analysis about sort of how often members of the press are mentioning a particular topic. And what I find most interesting about this is, is not just that OpenStack has tended to be quite a bit more uh, mentioned than the other cloud platforms. It's actually most interesting to me that the cloud computing term is actually tracking very closely to the OpenStack term. So what that says to me is that, that OpenStack is, is fundamentally driving the, the cloud computing discussion out there and is a, is a part of it. And we think that's pretty amazing because cloud computing is, regardless of what platform you pick, it is a better way to manage IT. And we certainly hope that um, you pick an open platform. And these are a, a few in this list, as well as Amazon EC2. Um, so a couple of other stats that are interesting to compare. I think this one's very important. So I talked about our 800 developers um, across all uh, the projects since we launched. This, this actually graphs every month how many developers each month are, are actively contributing. So you can see it's, it's close to 250 um, contributors and on average every month are contributing to OpenStack. And there are a couple of other cloud platforms on there that you may have heard of. Um, so we like this graph. We think this is very, we think this matters. People will maybe disagree, but you know, at the end of the day, we're building software as a community. So the size of our software development community matters. And when we want to write a book in a day, this is why we're able to do it. And I hope all of you consider yourselves members of the community um, when you walk out of here today. And I hope any of you who are developers um, get involved and learn how to, to contribute code because we want to continue to make this bigger and bigger so that more people have control over the destiny of OpenStack. Um, this is another way to sort of look at the data. This is the number of developers that contributed to a, a particular release. So a year ago, we released the Essex version. And we're about to release the Grizzly version. And you can see that it's more than doubled. So about 200 developers contributed to Essex. And we're going to have about 500 developers contributing to Grizzly. And that, that contributes to the rate of innovation in the platform. And when you pick a platform, you're betting on the future of that platform, not just, the, not just what it does today, but what's it going to do in five years? And is it going to be around? And is the community going to be thriving? And so this is why we take this very seriously. We want to make sure that we're always listening to our developers and helping them and facilitating the open development process. This really just shows you the number of lines of code. Um, of course, this doesn't really indicate the quality of the code, but um, it is still interesting nonetheless, I think, uh, given that we had a, a, only a few thousand lines of code when we launched about three years ago, and now have over 800,000 lines of code. So, you know, those developers are doing something, they're getting a lot of work done, and as we grow that, we expect this will continue to, to go up. Um, these are just a few quotes, I'm not going to read them all, but um, uh, one of the uh, one of my favorites was, uh, if there isn't an OpenStack cloud you fancy, wait a second, there's more, a lot more in the pipeline. So I'm going to talk in a little bit about how important it is for there to be a large footprint, a large installed base of OpenStack in order for it to be a healthy community and to, to, to be a successful platform. And this is indicative of, from GigaOM of a lot of the discussions going on with a lot of companies talking to the press about their plans. So we expect this year there will be many, many more OpenStack clouds launching, and that's a very good thing. Um, this actually was just last week. Um, I don't know if any of you know, saw the news, but IBM came out and said they were completely committed to OpenStack. They were going to bet all of their cloud platform products on OpenStack, and that that was the future of their cloud strategy, which you know was probably not a huge surprise to a lot of people since they were a Platinum member last year, but you know, it was good to hear them come out and, and make that commitment and got a lot of coverage, a lot of people were excited. This, this person, um, Ann Winblad from, from Winblad, uh, Hummer Winblad Ventures, said, I think the trend here is that OpenStack has won the race to become the standard and has done it rapidly. We've made some investments around the software-defined data center, and OpenStack is a key component. It is the OS for the cloud. 
Now, I, I personally don't believe that we've uh, won the race to become the standard. I'm glad that people um, feel that way. I think we have a lot of work left to do. But the reason that I'm even more excited to hear people say this is that um, this is a venture capitalist. This is someone who's putting real dollars, millions of dollars into companies based on OpenStack strategy. And that, that combined resource, if you think about all the investment IBM's making, HP, Dell, Red Hat, NEC, all these companies are investing in OpenStack. In addition to these startups with venture funding, all of that is, is gonna lead to a better platform for all of us. So with that, I wanted to dive into a little bit about uh, why we believe so many people are interested in OpenStack. And I think it's because what we're trying to do is much bigger than just building software, and it's not just a community, it's not just a vendor consortium. I'm sure many of you are familiar with vendor consortiums, they're quite common in technology, but there's a limit to how much you can achieve if that's all, that's the scope of your, of your vision. And we're also not trying to create a few small, moderately successful businesses. We're trying to do something much bigger in, when you look at, at the, the entirety of the opportunity. And what we're trying to do collectively, all of us in the community, is we're trying to create a platform ecosystem in the cloud. And these words get thrown around a lot. You probably hear the word ecosystem a lot, um, platform. But I want to talk about some examples of what we mean by that and, and how it applies to OpenStack and what we need to do collectively if we want to, to have a winning platform on our hands. Um, it's different than, than a lot of other cloud software uh, that's most of the other cloud platforms are um, written by one company or they're, they're predominantly led by one company. And you know we have a hundreds of, over 100 companies involved, many of whom are contributing every day to the software, and many other companies that build businesses on top of that platform. And uh, ultimately, we think you know, building a platform ecosystem in the cloud is what creates the most value for everyone, including users, as well as vendors. So, platform ecosystems, how do they work? Let's, let's talk about it. Um, we really see three forces at work in platform ecosystems, typically. The successful ones um, have, have all of these three elements, and, they have, and they're very, very strong e e individually and collectively. One is, of course, the technology platform itself. Um, you need to have the software people want to run with the right features, so you need to have um, software that's, that's um, solving a problem. Uh, you need to have an innovative ecosystem. So think about the applications and the service companies and the hardware companies that are all part of your ecosystem. They need to be innovating on top of your platform and below it and beside it and around it. And that's really a critical part of, of how you make a platform ecosystem win. And then last but not least, you need a global user footprint. And if you think about the way these things interrelate, if you're someone building an application for a platform, you want to go where the users are, right? And if you're a potential customer, a potential user, you want to go where the applications are. And both of those groups want to find good technology that meets their needs to build on top of or to, to operate. And in terms of the platform um, technology, Typically, the examples here are general purpose technology, so they're uh, widely applicable, um, easy to extend, and there's continuous rate of innovation as users uh, in the ecosystem say, I need this feature, I need this API call, and they get that feedback and it evolves, and those are things that we're looking to do in OpenStack. We also think that these types of markets and platforms emerge when there's a massive addressable market. So we need to be thinking very big when it comes to these types of ecosystem platforms. And um, you know, it tends to happen as well when users want more than what's in the base platform. So the platform itself is interesting, but they also want to be able to have things on top. And um, in terms of the ecosystem, you need to have a very rich ecosystem that can provide additional functionality whether it's technology or services that make the platform more usable or valuable. And it's a huge opportunity when you do it right for competitive businesses to come in and make money as part of this. So just to give you a few examples you've probably heard of, 
company called Apple. Um, the iOS platform, which is of course on the iPhone and, uh, and the, uh, the iPad and so forth, um, has uh, 700,000 apps on 400 million devices in 100 countries. The Android platform has a, a similar number of apps. Uh, they actually have almost 100 carriers and 44 device makers. So unlike Apple who makes all their phones, Android has the, the uh, advantage of being able to work with 45 uh, plus companies and have a very, very large install base. Um, Facebook has a lot of uh, developer, has a developer platform with a lot of apps and they're on a billion users now. Microsoft, people like to uh, kick Microsoft these days, but um, they've pretty much invented this platform ecosystem game. I mean, the Windows platform has four million apps. Even in 2011, they had 330 million PCs shipped with Windows, so um, they're not dead yet. And of course, OpenStack is software. There are tools and services that you would plug into it, management tools you might run on top of it, like a right scaler in Stratus. And uh, we have private and public clouds that make up the footprint. So why is this important? Well, we think that the greatest value is in the intersection of these things. So I mentioned before that the users want applications, the application developers want to go where the users are, and everybody wants a technology platform. And um, if you ignore any one of these forces, then the whole model collapses. You, you cannot win if you don't nail all three of these. Um, and so, and when you look at the data around the, the big markets, and we said that they only, it only really happens when there's a massive market, think about um, how ambitious these companies were when they created their platform. Apple and Android wanted to be on every smartphone on Earth, and eventually every phone, because they'll all be smartphones. Uh, Facebook wants to talk to every human on the internet. Microsoft wants to be on every PC. And in the case of OpenStack, um, the opportunity is nothing short of changing IT. I think OpenStack, as a cloud platform, has the potential to be in every data center, on every, uh, uh, talking or managing every server, every network device, and every storage system. That is huge. I mean, that's a multi-trillion dollar um, IT market when you think about every server and every data center. And although cloud computing is certainly has a lot of traction now, and it's no longer just hype, there's still a massive amount of a runway left um, to really orchestrate the whole data center. And there's one other thing that's very important that we shouldn't uh, lose sight of, which is people rely on OpenStack even for such important things as every silly cat photo on the internet. So if you like cats, you like OpenStack. Okay. Try to get a couple jokes in. But. Uh, it's a tough room. Okay, so let's see how all these companies have done. Well, Apple and Android have 90% market share. Facebook has 40 plus percent of every human on the internet. Microsoft still has over 90% share. And uh, although platform ecosystems develop around massive markets, they have few winners. This is very important to note. And I think we can all think of examples from the past of, of products that, that didn't have all three forces at work and they, they disappeared. And so, uh, if you look at this example of global cell phone market share, um, this is a famous quote from a movie called Glenn, Gary Glenn Ross with Alec Baldwin. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. But he says to his sales team, third place prize is you're fired. So, I think that's the case in a lot of platform ecosystems. Third place is you're, you're fired. Um, there's 8% market share for every single company that's all trying to compete with Apple and Android combined. That's very difficult to sustain long term. So we should be thinking about what if OpenStack can reach 50, 75% of the data center. Let's think big. Um, you know, and we know that there's a platform war building around cloud. Amazon is the early leader and we should be very, um, we should be very respectful of, of what they've achieved. I think um, it's very impressive. Uh, OpenStack is not as big of a platform today. It doesn't have as many tools. So we need to be thinking about how big we can get. Um, but, you know, the OpenStack footprint is spreading. There's different ways to look at this, but if you look at every OpenStack cloud in the world, we're actually in 10 cities. 
as of 2000, at the end of 2012, there was an OpenStack cloud, public cloud in 10 cities, and Amazon is in nine cities. So we're already getting to a tipping point where you could imagine in a couple of years where we might be in, in 40 cities. I mean, we had 700 cities where people download the operator's book. So we may be in 700 cities right now with private clouds, but um, with public clouds, you know, the opportunity is there. And because OpenStack can also um, drive private clouds, you can add that into the footprint as well. And that's very attractive for the ecosystem. Everybody wants to be part of the biggest platform because that's where the most opportunity is. And it's also the best thing for the users. I mean, when you pick a platform, you better pick one that you feel is going to be there in the long run. We really believe OpenStack is on its way to being there in the long run. And so, in summary, you know, why we believe OpenStack is the rising stack. The open platform, the community-driven development, that is very important. That graph of the number of developers is very important. I think people should, should um, you know, really look into that and, and understand when they're picking a platform um, who's really standing behind it. We believe in empowering our users and developers to drive the project forward. And we definitely believe in having broad support from across the industry and not having any single company um, really controlling the destiny of this project. And that's why we created the foundation. And last but not least, I'd like to extend an invitation to everyone in here and everyone who's listening. Um, first, I would invite you all to say no to vendor lock-in. I know that um, it's not always easy when you're picking a platform, but I would, I would invite you to say no, and that's because it's a lot more fun to work on an open project. It's a lot more fun if you're in a company that's making money by helping users instead of locking them in. I've worked at a lot of companies, not all of them feel this way, and I think it's a lot more fun. And I would say, say yes to freedom, Everybody here, I think, said they like freedom earlier, so hopefully uh, I'm in the right crowd. Um, and lastly, I would say that um, if you do work for a company that doesn't believe in helping customers and doing the right thing, if you, if you work for a company that actually is whole strategies around locking in customers and, and effectively taxing them, I would say that you absolutely have it in your control to make a difference either by leading your company into a more open path, or there are a thousand jobs in the OpenStack community today. We, in our last summit, we asked everyone in the audience, how many of you here are hiring? And almost every single hand went up. So if you believe in freedom and you believe in OpenStack, then please work on it full time. There are many opportunities to do that. And so I would just invite you to join the revolution and OpenStack. Thank you very much. エンダイはエデュケーションエンドリサーチオンオープンクラウドです。それではどうぞよろしくお願いいたします。ちょっと大胆の構えなので、時間があればドライブのデモをやろうと思って用意してたんですけどネットワークが一回切れちゃったのでもう一回休憩してもらっていいですか<笑><笑>